this was what, uh, a few days after Yolanda? No, this is January. It oh. happened November 8th. Yeah. This was January 
this was one of the worst areas hit, and a very large population died here, and we're still covering that up. So this is like screen here a little bit, and in uh, in the U.S. a little bit. In museums? Yeah. And my mom was actually able to raise more money by showing this video. So this is the 
workshop that Karen Flores and I did, and um, we just asked them to tell a story. And this is in Cebu. That's my style. Very raw. And I edit very intuitively. Parallels your your style, like what you do in your art events. Mm -hmm. Very much. That's why I wanted you to see it. Right. Everything connects. Everything. in your art events become radically yours. Like, for instance, uh, the, the barter element in the, in the art of resistance. Did you find yourself owning that as well? What do you mean by owning that? Oh, like, it, it also becomes a rallying cry. Yes, I mean, and I only kind of understood that after, like when, um, through a mutual friend, um, a group of um, tenant farmers who are organic farmers wanted to meet with me about seeing if they could set up a barter trade for their crops. You know, and everything's really bad timing. I mean, I don't think I've recuperated from just doing the markets of resistance in Baguio, I mean, it really took a tremendous amount of life out of me because people, a lot of people were coming up to me, um, thanking me, um, for the, especially the indigenous people in the market, for... And some people questioning your, your intent as well. Questioning in the sense of like, so for those people who wanted the markets to be taken down, like they said, you know, why do you want to do this? It's so ugly here. Why would you want to have an exhibition in the market that smells? And we want to tear this all down, you know? And, you know, I actually at one point just waved some guy away because I was like, why are you asking me such a stupid question? And I just refused to answer him because I, I thought, um, you know, markets for me, and I've always been drawn to markets everywhere, every country I can go to, because in the U.S. we don't, we have like these trendy markets now. Yeah. In the cities, oh, yeah. they have like organic markets, like things yeah. where it's very expensive, um, and it's trendy, right? And um, when I travel, outside of the U.S., inevitably the first place I'll try to go is a market. Because that is where I think culture is, that's where you get a sense of people, that's where you get a sense of life. In a supermarket, you don't get a sense of anything but people rushing around having to get what they need. Which is true of these markets as well. But in these markets, you hear stories, you hear people's gossip, their, their troubles, their joys, all kinds of things. And, you know, on a very personal level, my, on my mother's side, my great-grandmother um, used to have a, 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 an ox, an ox with a cart. And she, my grandmother, had walked from Huevesija, <laughs> um, 
peddling their wares and then settled in the Verkhoff market. And then she eventually, my great-grandmother eventually transformed all that into like, a, uh, like an eatery. But my great-grandmother, um, my, my grandmother, who was quite a character, um, she like hung out in Divisoria. That was like her fife, you know, and she, she, you know. And so I think, without even knowing it, I think it's like in, in my blood somehow. And that I've just always been drawn to markets. And I've always felt that it has a element to it that's a lot more honest than supermarkets. You can trade. You know, like, I was hearing all these stories about my Lola, about how, like, people, you know, if you need eggs and you have pork, you figure out what's the equivalent that you need. If you have something and, you know, it's like that. And I know, like, with my friends and I, um, you know, if, if I need a little bit of money, one of my friends will hire me to do research, right? So that's the trade, right? Um, it's things like that, and those are, you know, those are things that I continue to do. Aren't you sometimes um, irritated that some people would zoom in on, on an element, like, for instance, with the markets? Uh, a lot of people on Facebook would zoom in on the barter thing and uh, make a big issue out of it and not uh, uh, forget about the other things. Well, unfortunately, and I don't know where on Facebook you're seeing this, I, I haven't been able to, I haven't, I haven't actually gotten a lot of feedback, personally, about it. Um, um, the, the people that were there in Baguio, and like my students, and I had other people going around the markets, interviewing Baguio people, to ask how are they responding to this, and what is it like for them. And um, um, the difficulty is that, yeah, they didn't see the whole process. They didn't see how the students, how their lives had transformed in a way, you know, and I'm still trying to figure that all out. Um, because the art exhibitions became the final product. And, and, in, and in Manila, it was even more different, you know, because People had heard about this thing that happened up in Baguio, and they were all like, oh, sorry, we couldn't come up, and we couldn't experience that, and it's much more immediate. Like, when we did the barter down here, you couldn't just barter right then and there, because for two reasons. Um, one, we didn't have enough work, and the, they would have gone away with it right then and there. Two, the majority of the Manila people weren't willing to just go and get what the artists wanted right then and there either. Mm -hmm. And as a result, a, a number of people who were bartering um, three weeks later decided to cancel the barter, even though they signed agreements, because they just said, well, we don't need it really. You know, so it's a whole, it was a whole different kind of thing that happened. You would have to still go and get, mm -hmm. so like, um, most of my students wanted the same things. They wanted art supplies. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the, the Baguio indigenous artists that participated, they, they wanted electric drills. They wanted things that they need to work with. And they did get that. Um, and there were, and I didn't want to tell my students this, but there were a number, most of the people that came to barter were either people that I knew or that heard of me, and they were people who quote unquote were collectors and they got a lot of stuff and they didn't realize, you know, and it was beautiful that it leveled the playing field and that it wasn't about who is this person, it's what is this work. So you, you, you don't mind, you don't mind that some people would treat it more like an economics thing and then some people would treat it more like an anthropology thing and then some other people would treat it like an entirely art thing. But you're not well, worried about it. It's that not that I... It's not that I don't mind, it's just, you can't control that. You know, I mean, you can, you can try to put it out there so that other people can try to understand. I mean, I had wall text, and it was very frustrating. I had pamphlets, and, and so many people didn't read. And I can't control if a person wants to read or not. You know, 
I can make a flippant comment, you know. So it becomes a part of the thesis as well. Yeah, I mean, look. There's a point when you put anything out in the world, you have to let go. Yeah. Right? And that's why the process is more challenging and more interesting for me because it's more profound. The, the exhibitions, yeah, they become whatever they're going to be and you can't control it. If somebody wants to interpret your art in one way, it may not be the way you might have intended it, but what are you going to do? Say to the, the buyer or the viewer, hey, you misread this, so don't buy it or don't look at it. I mean, I worked as a security guard in the Museum of Modern Art when I was 17. And people treat me like shit. They treat guards like horrible people. And that's not right, you know? I mean, it was amazing to me. And the artwork itself, you know, like... But you can't help that. that you have to look at the history of art and, and, and you know, um, capitalism's relationship to art. I mean, who started collecting? Monarchies. You know, I mean, churches, religious people, you know, I mean, it's, there's, so you have to look at all these other things versus art that's for utilitarian reasons and that have function, you know, and I think the best I could do was generate all of, bring out, draw forth all of those contradictions. Consider yourself in the academic sense, uh, postmodernist or post-structuralist, wherein the the scattering of readings, the, the open text of it all, is part of the intention. Yes, but Jojo, I'm not going to put those labels on myself. Uh -huh. You just did. But the way that I've always felt about theory is, you take it in. Um, obviously. There are many theories and philosophies that have affected me, and I've absorbed in my system, and I use them. And that's where the function of theory is. If, if you can't use it, throw it away. I think it's very important to, to do, kind of take yourself through all those movements, right? So, um, whether it be going from Altazor and signs and semiotics and all these things, and then looking at um, structuralist thinkers. I mean, there are people who definitely influence me, for sure. And then deconstruction, all these things. Yes, did they... Uh, I think it's more unconsciously than consciously. Like, when I set out to do Markets of Resistance, when you look at my proposals, it's clear that I'm thinking about certain things. Okay? It's very clear. Or, you know, on a theoretical level. But, um, You're also open to variations as it goes along, as it progresses. Oh yeah, I have to be, because that's where it's organic. Even to the extent that everything you said in your proposal was, uh, it took a 180 degree turn. No, it wasn't a 180 degree turn. Okay. In fact, um, where I think aspects of market services has failed, is no, I, we I, don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean in terms of having uh, fulfilled the, the direction that you wanted and having failed in that direction, but in terms of being surprised by by veering towards another direction. Oh, of course, because what you write on paper is never what happens in life. What you write on paper, you can have. You can try to achieve as much of it as, as you want. And for instance, I wanted six market stalls. I wanted the Muslims involved. I wanted the, the market stalls where the Chongays were also, you know, the Muslims who had migrated to Baghdad. And, you know, there were so many things that were beyond because we either couldn't get the permits, um, a lot of vendors didn't want to participate. Um, it was difficult for, um, uh, you know, people got very frustrated with the way I was presenting the project because they thought, uh, yeah, in some ways, like, if, if I'm talking to my, um, 
indigenous friends and they were all like, oh, let's just get drunk, you know, let's just get stoned. Uh -huh. You know, why do we have to talk about these things, you know? And I'm like, because I need you to understand. Uh -huh. But I realized, too, that, and it was frustrating because that was like my American self kind of saying, I understand the cultural differences, I understand the difference between spatial and temporal, but nonetheless, when you're having to orchestrate it, and you're responsible for other things, and you have to write reports, and this, this, and that. It got frustrating, and because I was on a timetable, and I couldn't move certain things. Um, you know, and so there are things where you have to roll with these things, right? Um, and and I wanted I wanted one of the stalls in the heart of Mimesy Park, because that's where all the tourism is, of the foreigners, of the Filipinos, of everybody. Say yes. The next day, a vendor would say, "Well, what you're doing is an art," yeah. and that was also interesting. I wish we could have gotten that on camera because we got, I wasn't there. But what this one vendor said to Kauaian and this guy Rocky Kahiga, who was one talking to he said to them, "Why are why are you replacing our goods? Because what you're doing isn't art. What we're doing is art." So you see, there, there are those kinds of contradictions. And what I can do in film form and in book form is draw that out. And, it, you know, it's more difficult in real life, in real time. You know, um, uh, were there Ivalois and, and Kalinga and various different, like if there were Bontok Ivalois that were there in the urban setting, could they understand some of that? Absolutely. Um, it was only after the fact when the people, we sat down and we were talking about the experiences, because a lot of people were, I, I was really kind of a wreck. I mean, it was very difficult for me to enjoy the experience because I was exhausted and I was working like 16 hours a day and, and going from one stall to another that were in different parts of the market. And, you know, you name it, having to troubleshoot about a lot of things. We ran out of work at one point. So the theme and the topics were no longer being addressed. You know, and what are you going to do, shut it all down? You know, I mean, so there are all kinds of variables that you have to be open to and allow those things to just happen. And become part of the... Ah, absolutely. And, you know, I have was confronted with um, a lot of things in my personality. Personality. My person, yeah, my personality in the sense of because I've never done a project like this. I've done many different kinds of projects where I've worked with communities, like when I was in Laos. I'm working with kids and teaching them how to do a two-camera documentary, five-minute documentary, and they've never seen a video camera before. And I can't speak Lao or French, and I'm communicating through photographs and through stick drawings and through just handing them cameras and going, let's go, let's go for it. Can I, can I ask you a hard question? No, I'm sure you, any question you're going to ask me is not that hard. Um, Filipino intellectuals um, might have this tendency to accuse any Phil and artist as being a neo-colonial element. Yes, I get that. You get that a lot. No, I don't get that a lot. Okay. I mean, I... It, what, when I started Market Services, it was a question that I raised to the people I was working with. Um, I think that um, knowing a lot of Phil Am scholars, um, and very early on, you know, when I even, you know, um, I have only experienced that personally once, okay? Um, I don't get defensive about it. I hope, because I understand it, and I understand how if people don't know you, and people don't attempt to have a conversation with you, or if they don't um, look at your work. Or they're haughty in their own... Well, whatever, their, you know, they, got, they have their own issues, right? right? right. And, and am I a privileged person to be able to come here and do the things I do? Yeah, I am. I'm middle class, at least 
just by American standards. Um, you know, and that goes back to this judgment thing. I mean, we're judged constantly as minority Americans. And as a child, I learned very early, judgment does not help. So I can't stop somebody from judging me. You know, and one thing that I do get a lot is, why won't you speak Filipino? You know, if you spend all this time here, if you do all these projects here, why don't you speak the language? And it's more complicated than I can ever express why I can't speak the language. And it's very painful. And it's actually one of the reasons why I won't be staying in this country. I won't be living here anymore. I'm going to be coming back and forth. And it's not entirely because of language. I mean, I go out into remote areas. On the other hand, there are people who take advantage of that position. What do you mean? Uh, instead of um, approaching it as a let down on yourself, you approach it as not as a liability, but as an advantage, as a tool, wherein you could um, push yourself up you know. <laughs> Well, if a person wants to learn English, then that's one thing. You know, I mean, I've tried learning Filipino at least 15 times. Well, it's probably helpful in the corporate world, but not in the uh, in the kind of art that you're doing. Right. Uh, the, your your um, being unable to speak all the language. You lose a lot. I mean, I'm doing a project in Macquarie Edis right now, and I've in, been going into rather remote areas, and they speak dialects that no one else can speak. So, you know, it's it, also, my yeah. friends that are that are lowlanders that are, you know. It's um, also ironic that a lot of people who speak the language are. Less interested in, in the interest of the community than you are. <laughs> well, because we it's, it's not just about verbal language. Okay. It's about human language. And you don't always, if you're in distress and you're in a foreign country, um, or even in your own country, you know, there was an incident where um, this man was coming up the subway and uh, it took me a while to. He was Asian, and I, we couldn't figure out what language he spoke because his head was bleeding so badly. Nobody would stop to help. So I did, and you know, and I kept screaming and yelling, "Can anybody speak Korean? Can anybody speak Chinese? Can, I, can anybody speak certain dialects within Chinese?" Because the area, the neighborhood that I lived in, they speak these different dialects. And his head was bleeding so profusely that like head wounds are really bad. So my arms were like covered in blood and I just kept trying to put the pressure on his head because his brains were coming out. And nobody would do a thing, not one person. So this friend that I was with asked me, why are you doing this? And I said, I'm a traveler in foreign countries all the time. And I would hope that somebody would have the empathy to want to come to my aid instead of letting me lead to it. And it's really that basic, you know, it's really, yeah. language is not yeah, always verbal. that's a perfect example. Language perfect is, example. is something beyond that, right? I mean, of course, does it inevitably help to know how to speak somebody else's language? Absolutely. But it isn't just about... It's them. about human relationships. It's about it empathy. is. It, it really is. And, and I don't also want to dismiss not knowing another country's language. It is really, really frustrating. My Lolo's book is about to come out in two weeks, and he was a big Tagalog, I mean, through and through and through. I mean, the guy was the first editor of the first Tagalog newspaper. And the fact that a granddaughter of his who spends 30 years going back and forth to his homeland can barely speak the language is really sort of a great contradiction. <laughs> But that doesn't deter me. Yeah. Then again, you speak the language of the heart that a lot of people, that a lot of people yeah. um, don't have. I mean, there are fluent Tagalog speakers who actually do nothing but exploit their own people. <laughs> but that's why I've always believed that one can't always, at this, in 2015, 
Filipinos in the diaspora, no matter where we're born and raised. We can't just boil it all down to it's the fault of the Spaniards and the Americans. Filipinos have been colonizing themselves right alongside for almost since the moment that they were quote unquote liberated. That's and a that's, that's a hard thing for people to swallow. Right? I mean, that's a really hard thing uh, for, it's for people to wrap their minds around. Because it's like, <gasps> what are you saying? You know? Over here. But you have to go around. It's one way. What's the matter? That's how it was a good sound bite. Do we still have it on? Yeah, yeah. So what are you guys planning on doing with this anyway? Uh, have you got to our, our... I only... Okay. I, I have to be mind really... Mind. Oh, sure. I, I, I have been so busy that I, I only got to visit your site when you first started. Oh, okay. And from the very beginning when Marcel showed me the, the site, I immediately was attracted to it because I like what you're doing. Um, I like what you're challenging. But I haven't been able to see how you're actually, you know, uploading and whatever, this sort of thing. Um, I hope that I was clear about, um, you know, what I was trying to say in terms of, um, you know, questions that you're asking about fill -ams and questions that you're asking about, um, Whatever form of criticism you know, that comes comes about, um, that's inevitable. I mean, I guess to be very clear on it, that comes with the territory, right? No matter who you are, right? No matter if your project is a project that feels new to somebody, those questions and those comments and the, the criticism will always be. And also because with a with a title like that, you can't avoid. You know, it's to provoke, too. So, you know, I have to be, as the maker, I have to be responsible for that. I can't answer. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've been at this for so long in my life that I have, I've been, that's why I said any question you ask me, it's not that I'm necessarily so comfortable with, with addressing them. Did you but, want to discuss some political resistance to your existence? <laughs> so, tell me. Tell me what you've been hearing. Because that's what I'd like to hear. Oh. You know, I'm not going to crumble, Joe. Mm -hmm. None of those. What do you mean? Was there resistance from the local government? No. Or, um, no. Um, not that I'm aware of. What do you think was the reason for that? Um, you know, somebody expressing his desire to tear down the exhibition of the public? No, they didn't want to tear it down. Oh. They asked why would I want to do a project like this in the marketplace when it's so ugly? The market's dirty. The market smells. Why would I want to have exhibition stalls there? Why wouldn't I do it like somewhere else within Baguio City? He was uh, from one of the Ivaloi families who owns a lot of land. Owns a lot of? Land. I mean, I've been asked actually um, from various different people. I mean, even I went to the art fair opening, and several people asked me if, if I would consider doing this at the art fair or in Manila. And I said no. It's different. And I wouldn't consider. Maybe I would consider Nepa Mart because I used to live. My family home is right there, and. I used to go every Sunday with my elders to market, and that's the only market that I would consider maybe doing something like this. But Manila is such a different animal, and and it really is about Baguio because it has to do also with tourism and indigeneity and the way that indigenous people are forced to have to sell their culture so many ways and to, it's very complex it's a very very complex system and it's not about judging them for doing it they have to survive i mean if you go down to uh, in 
Mindanao were the uh, they're weavers. Uh, this is um, some wanga. I'll, I'll get it in a second. But the last time I was there, I was very saddened by the fact that whoever their middleman is has been telling them to just make um, sarongs with dolphins and full moons and butterflies and all the stuff to sell in Boracay. And um, these weavers are amongst the oldest of weavers. Their, their, their work is so fine, it takes them a very long time to be able to do this. And like in all many of the indigenous cultures, they can no longer survive based on their products. Um, and I go right now to Megatrade. I was there yesterday. And DTI is um, putting forth the non-indigenous weavers in a way that is detrimental to the weaving communities. And I went to visit a lot of the weaving communities in the Locos, and uh, the, the Tingyin women, the, the, you know, I mean, it's, that's a whole other can of worms, but it's why part of my other response to that man was, well, I am working on another project. That is, I'm not gonna say a follow-up to Markets of Resistance, but it's what my friends and I learned from Markets of Resistance, and where I feel there's only so much an outsider can do. All we can try to do, or me as an individual who cares about certain things, is to try to plant seeds when you have no money. And how do you do that? Well, you go to their villages and you have conversations. And you try to share your love for their craft and why they should try to continue. But how do you say that to somebody who doesn't have enough money to buy eggs? How do you say that to somebody who has to sell their chickens? It sounds like a very fucked up thing because I don't have enough money to just say. And if you just give somebody the money, what are they actually getting? It's that whole biblical thing, give a man a fish, you know, and he'll fish for, you know, teach a man to fish and he'll fish forever. You gotta give them the tools and the skills, but it's it's like you're, you're up against such a huge system. I'm a consumer. I have some really nice things. You know, I don't make pretend that I'm a walking, talking con contradiction myself. I just don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be honest about it, right? I mean, I am not somebody who's opposed to the art market at all. And I think, for me, that was sad of certain things that came back to my ears about some people thinking that I was against um, the market, and I'm not against the market. I think people need to understand the difference between art practice and business. And if a young person is only gonna make art thinking I'm gonna be so rich and whatever, no, I've watched careers rise and fall. And the Philippines is different. The Philippines, it is a very, very different system than the international system because the market here doesn't need the outside world to sustain. It doesn't, at least not right now, from what I can see. The market here is, is rotating around interests that are internal to the country. But what I still find unfortunate is that there's not As an outsider, I'd like to see more support for the longevity of, of the culture that's coming out of what's happening. That, and I've said this to, to friends of mine who care about heritage culture in the arts. If, why not, you know, rather than just buy a painting that's, you know, a million pesos, how about put a million pesos into scholarships, into young people who don't come from the big schools, who may not come from an art school at all, but who have talent. Why does it all have to be centralized to Manila? Well, you know, if you come from another province, you know, why, I know why 
I'm not stupid. It's a figure of speech. But nonetheless, that's why I say I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, an imp, I'm a practical or an impractical dreamer and a windmill chaser. I still have to ask these questions because I can't help myself because I know the contradiction that I am. I know that in order for me to, when I ran the Asian American International Film Festival, the only way that we could get our films out was to make a deal with Asia Society. And many of my friends that were part of the Asian American activist communities were furious with me for doing that. And I kept saying, you guys got to trust me. We got the box. And 15,000 people for 10 days came through those doors and got to see Asian films that nobody's ever gotten a chance to see. And my programming is very deliberate, and I'm not the only one that programs. But I said it before, it's SS, it's su subtle subversion. If you, you know, I once did this thing um, in LA, and the former president almost was there to like showcase Philippine goods and all this kind of stuff. And this is when, in 97, when the world, you know, was saying that the 21st century is going to be the Pacific century. But then all the money stuff started happening and the Asian economy collapsed, right? And the Philippines was able to stay afloat, but because of remittances. The Philippine economy can still stay afloat because of, you know, millions of Filipinos working abroad. And too many people think that's a good thing.